Okay, so welcome to our next lecture on resource management. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities, and specifically we're going to focus on designers, manufacturers, and uh, consumers. So when we're looking at this, the role of the designer. The designer is really in control of the beginning phase of a product's life cycle. So, you know, almost actually before this whole introduction thing right here, these are the four basic stages, right? So before you actually launch a product, um, not necessarily the later stages. So, you know, as the later stage, there's some, you know, design elements here, but mostly it's, it's, it's done your roles before. So one of the things that we can do that we have control over as designers is to design with fewer materials. So we try to use fewer materials rather than more materials. Um, try to keep the idea of energy efficiency in mind. So in any way, shape, or form, you try to reduce the amount of energy it takes to both produce your product, but also the energy that it uses. Um, design it for disassembly. So we want to make it relatively simple to disassemble, and this is important, you know, if you want to fix something. Um, minimizing parts and components. So the fewer parts and components that, that something has, the better it is because it's easier to recycle, it's easier to uh, produce, it takes less energy, it takes less parts, it takes less material, lots of things. So minimizing parts and components, and then using recyclable materials as much as possible. So these are things that we can do as designers um, in eco design. All right, let's move on to the manufacturers. So this is really where most of the energy materials and waste is going to occur. So, um, you know, they're really, manufacturers are really in control of much of the product's life cycle. You know, after the, you know, it's introduced, it's, it's mostly them. So manufacturers can control a lot of the following things. So they can um, control manufacturing techniques. So they can preferably limit the, uh, environmental effects, you know, like for instance, they, they could use injection molding because that has very little waste involved. So if you're making something out of plastic, injection molding is a way to do it. Um, quality control, they can make sure that the, the products that they're making are, are um, high quality and that there aren't that many mistakes because mistakes or errors in manufacture basically equate to waste, right? Because no one's going to buy a broken thing. So those things end up becoming waste. So um, having good quality control will ensure that there's less errors and less waste. They can standardize components and sub-assemblies for easy replacement. So you know, this is the idea of, um, you know, if you have components that are easily, that are the same across a whole product range. So let's say that you're a company and you're producing electronics. If you're using the same electronic components across an entire range of products, then it's easier to replace those components. Or you're a car manufacturer and you know you have a certain type of seatbelt, let's say, that all your cars have the exact same seatbelt components and sub-assemblies. It makes it easier to replace them if, if you need to. Um, you want to try to minimize your energy use, emissions, right? So this is emissions of things like CO2 or other greenhouse gases or PM2.5 particles and all that stuff. Water pollution and other elements uh, of the LCA, right? So you're going to try and reduce the energy um, emissions and other elements as much as possible as a manufacturer if you're following the eco-design principles. Okay, so roles of the consumer. This is probably the people who have, well, I mean, they have they have some um, control, but they, they have less control than, than uh, designer and manufacturers and products. But, uh, you know, they're, they're primarily in charge of decisions to purchase things. They can choose to purchase or not purchase. They can use things correctly and maintain them, and they can dispose of products correctly. So, you know, they, they have the market pull, right? So designers are going to create products that the market wants. So consumers have to consider what do they want. If they want things that are bad for the environment, then that's what that's what manufacturers are going to produce. If they want things that are good for, for the environment, then that's what manufacturers are going to produce. So that comes back to this idea of what are they purchasing. Spending patterns. So do you want to buy something that is a durable product versus a disposable one? You know, this is Kind of the idea of something like reusable water bottles. Would you rather have a reusable water bottle or a plastic water bottle? Um, 
they're in charge of disposal of the product. So are they disposing of the product after, after its use, um, after its, you know, its life cycle is over, are they disposing of it properly or are they just disposing of it improperly? Um, consumers can force designers and manufacturers to be more green, usually through their buying power. So again, what are they buying, right? This kind of goes back up to the whole market pull thing. They can use products properly. So, you know, if you're using a product properly, it generally will last longer than if you use a product improperly. Uh, you know, just a quick example of this would be, say, like a tent. If you properly store your tent, so you, for instance, make sure that it's dry and clean before you put it away, then it will last longer than if you put it away wet and dirty because the wet and dirt will cause mold to grow and it will destroy the tent. Okay, um, proper maintenance of a product. So if you are properly maintaining your product, that means that you're cleaning it appropriately, you are making sure that you are, you know, greasing it or whatever it takes. You know, I'm thinking in this case like a, a bicycle. A bicycle will last longer if you properly take care of it. If you don't properly take care of it, it won't last as long. So consider that, that proper maintain maintenance is really in the realm of the consumer. Um, I've had a, a mountain bike for close to, what, uh, 15 years now, and it still works great because I take care of it, right? I grease the chain, I make sure that I, uh, you know, change the brake cables and, and, you know, refill the oil where, you know, it has like uh, oil gears and uh, it's got some oil in the uh, front fork. I make sure that I keep those things well maintained so that it'll last longer. Okay, and then we can also provide feedback to manufacturers about how they're doing. Okay, so this is the role of the consumer, and this is all going into that whole idea of, of eco-design and, and your responsibilities. Okay, now the IB says that you should be familiar with the United Nations um, uh, environmental policy, okay? So, or sorry, environmental program, um, which is the UNEP, okay? And here's a, a quick video about that. It's like three minutes, so go ahead and watch that, and it, it'll help to... Um, you know, you need to identify its major considerations, which we'll go through right now. Okay, so basically the, the UNEP um, works on this idea of the triple bottom line, right? And we talked about this in the HL component, but the triple bottom line is essentially what is good for people, what is good for planet, is also good for profit, and it's sustainable. Okay, so those are the triple, these three things right here are the triple, and the bottom line is that uh, you'll do well, okay? So let's look at these. So people, with people, what we want to do is create um, and meet social and equity requirements, right? So we want people to be happy socially within their lives, and we want there to be equity. This is different than equality, remember. Equity is, is everybody getting their fair share rather than everybody getting an equal portion, okay? So one of the things that we want to do is uh, reduce urban and uh, minority unemployment. And these are really, by the way, focused mostly on developing countries rather than developed countries. Okay, so we want to make sure that the poor in urban areas and minorities are, are not un unemployed. Uh, we want to improve working conditions, so safety and well-being. We want to um, have acceptance and integration of minorities into economic activity. So we want people to be accepted and and uh, and be integrated. We want to reduce income inequality, so or inequity. Sorry. So inequity means that again, getting your fair share rather than getting an equal share. We want to enhance the number of skilled workers. So skilled workers get paid more than unskilled workers. So we want to try to enhance those numbers. Of course, we want to get rid of child labor. We want more uh, literacy. We want to provide basic health services, clean water. We want to reduce population growth because that's that's a big danger. And in fact, one of the things that we notice is that when people are richer, they have fewer children. Okay, and then there are, there are arguably too many people on the planet already. Um, we want to improve the status of women. We want to adopt internationally international employment standards. Um, again, these are focused on developing countries, right? And we want to increase social opportunity and community interaction, um, and then abolish uh, large-scale dislocation of people. So this is, for instance, refugees. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that can be economic refugees, or that can be um, you know, ones that are 
fleeing. Well, mostly I think what they're talking about here is economic refugees. So these are migrants who are, you know, seeking to go to a richer country so that they can uh, make more money to send money back to their, their country. Be better if they were to be able to make a living within the country that they're from. Okay, we're looking at the planet. So we want to make sure that the designs that we create will fit within the carrying capacity of and support ecosystems. So carrying capacity means like we're not using more than the um, earth can replace. So this is we're not using more resources than can be replaced. So we want to reduce fossil fuel energy usage because that is a... Um, a non-renewable resource. So the Earth's carrying capacity, you know, once once non-renewable resources are used, they're gone. We want to use renewable energy sources that will help, help reduce the fossil fuel usage. We want to increase energy efficiency because that'll, you know, help with both of these things. So when you use, you know, for instance, you know, in lighting, you would be better if you were to use um, LED lights rather than incandescent lights because they use a lot less energy. We want to reduce uh, toxic chemicals, so using less toxics. We want to clean up contaminated sites. So these are sites that are already contaminated. We want to clean those up. We want to improve levels of waste prevention. So, you know, having less waste and recycling and reusing when possible. The UN wants us to reduce and treat industrial emissions. So these are things like CO2 or NO2 or or SO2 or PM2.5 particles. They want us to reduce those kinds of things. Reduce the quality of wastewater, quantity of wastewater, and, and promote treatment. So um, having less wastewater dumped into our rivers and streams and oceans. And um, if you are dumping them into the ocean streams and, and rivers, um, treat them before they get out there so that they, they get rid of all the nastiness. And it's just, you know, water. Stop over-exploitation of renewable resources in water. Okay, so we want to stop the, the you know, um, for instance, you know, cutting down rainforests. Rainforests will regrow, but if we cut them all down, then there will be nothing for them to regrow, right? And then water also, we, you know, there's very little fresh water on this planet. When we run out or lose that fresh water, it's going to cause problems. So coming, you know, Connecting with this, we want to stop deforestation. We don't want soil loss, erosion, or ecosystem destruction. And then this is an interesting one because much of the much much of the world uses um, wood to cook their food and heat their homes and things like that, or they use dung, animal dung. If you're in a place where there's very few trees but there's grass, uh, quite a lot of times people will collect, um, you know, you know, dung from animals. So particularly cattle and they'll burn that. But the problem with those things is that they cause a lot of lung issues with people. So it, it can really damage people's lungs and it actually causes quite a, quite a lot of uh, disease and death around the world when people um, use wood and dung to heat their homes and, and cook their food. Okay, so profits. We wanna create an equitable value for customers and stakeholders along the, the value chain. Okay, so we want there to be value for companies and stakeholders. So people in a company, they're there to make money, right? So we want them to actually make money. And the stakeholders are people who back them. So like their, their shareholders and things like that. So we, we do want these, these people to make money. We want value for customers. We want customers to feel like the products that they're buying are good quality and that they value them. We want a fair business model. So this goes along with like fair trade. The people who are producing in the sort of uh, growth and extraction areas generally do not benefit as much as the people who, who uh, make the finished product. So, you know, some of that wealth needs to trickle down to the people who are extracting um, in order for them to, to um, be better off. Um, we want a fair share of the linkage. This kind of goes with these two here also, you know, uh, you know, global value of the value chain. So are, are we, linking the profit at the end to the people along the way. Um, are, it, are we linking small and medium-sized companies in developing countries to large transnational companies? You know, is this something that can happen? Um, fair prices for commodities and raw materials kind of goes back up to these two. And ownership and credit opportunities for entrepreneurs. You know, outside in developing countries, their people do not have the ability to get credit, and credit is basically a loan. So if you 
want to expand a business or start a business, it's very difficult if, if you're in a developing country to be able to, to get the money that you need to start a business. So trying to increase that. Okay. Um, what we're doing here is looking at converging tech. And this is also from the IB. Um, so converging technologies, this is a synergistic um, merging. So synergistic means that they work together. Merging of nanotechnology, so small technology, biotechnology, which is life technology, uh, information, communication, technologies, and cognitive science. So basically, converging, converging means to come together from different directions and meet at a place or a point or whatever. Okay. So basically, the example from the IB says that, you know, a typical example of converging technology is a smartphone, right? So this is a bunch of different technologies that are, you know, nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, information and communication, and they're all stuck together in one smartphone, right? So you've got uh, um, students should consider the smartphone as a converging technology in terms of the materials required to create it. So there's lots of different materials required to create it. It's energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so those are converging technologies. So in other words, many separate technologies meet in a, in a cell phone. And so that's, a, that's an interesting thing because if we didn't have those, then you would have lots of separate things. So, you, you know, and like in the old days when your phone was just a phone, you know, you didn't, you, you would have a phone, but then you would have something to play your music. You'd have something to watch your movies. You'd have something to keep track of this and, and do your, you know, you'd have a computer to do your, your, uh, um, you know, emails and stuff with. So like it, it incorporates all those things. And if we can incorporate together a bunch of different things, we can reduce the impact because you'll have fewer things that need to be manufactured. So that's kind of the, the point of all this converging technology is that if you can, if you can bring together separate technologies into one thing, then you can reduce the amount of, of um, materials and energy and waste that, that, uh, is incorporated with the other technologies. Okay, so let's look at some uh, advantages and disadvantages of converging technology. So once again, try to get this in your head that what we're talking about here is it is better, usually better to have multiple things in one device than to have separate devices. For instance, I have a scanner, printer, copier in my house, right? Those are three separate um, pieces of technology. And in the past, those would have been three separate things. Um, today, I have them all in one, right? So rather than having three devices that requires, you know, the manufacture of all those three things, it's just one device. Okay, so the advantage of, of having converging technology is that you have a single device with multiple functions. It eliminates the need to buy multiple devices miniaturizes the, uh, the products and it increases portability, right? So it makes it easier to carry around. And it also reduces the need for materials, costs, and environmental impact. So that, that kind of goes, again, if you think about my printer, copier, scanner, that was three devices that is now one. So there's just less of everything. Um, a disadvantage, though, is that if one of those technology fails, the others can fail as well, right? So if my, if my scanner breaks, then basically um, I no longer have a copier and maybe the printer doesn't work either. Um, I can increase the functionality of the device, but it may be inefficient. So sometimes, you know, you know, this is an issue that, you know, uh, some cameras, you know, DSLR cameras don't really work that well as a video camera. They have that function, but they just don't work that well. So maybe you would want to. Um, the tech may not work well on its own. So a DVD player, you know, DVD play versus a, a DVD game or console, right? So like a DVD player, really, you can't do much with it, but play DVDs. But if you had a, uh, a game console, then you could actually do two things with it. Okay, that's it for today. See you guys next time.